Brad Geist and his wife run an awesome business called Benedict's Beads. Their website, benedictsbeads.com, has a wide variety of handmade rosaries and Catholic gifts. Their rosaries are not only beautiful, but designed with theological meaning. I mean, look at this one. It's Our Lady, Ark of the New Covenant. That's a pretty cool typological rosary. Benedict's Beads also specializes in a unique kind of rosary called a ladder rosary. They're built strong, and you can customize them as you like. In fact, here's the rosary that I designed on their website. It's a St. Peter rosary. As you can tell from the color of the beads, it matches Peter's iconography. I was able to select the crucifix down here, attach a medal of St. Peter, and the centerpiece of this beautiful rosary is the Jerusalem cross, meaning to convey when Peter was the head of the Jerusalem church. But the thing I want to highlight is that with this laterization process, this rosary is incredibly strong, and I know it's not going to break easily on me. But if you have a broken rosary, then Benedict's Beads also repairs them. This is an awesome Catholic business run by a growing Catholic family, and I recommend all my listeners check them out. I know I'm buying another rosary. Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Catholicism. Today I'm here with Dr. Daniel Vecchio, again to discuss uh, something about Eliakim. Uh, this time we're going to be discussing Eliakim's successors. Well, Daniel, I'm so excited to have you on the show again. And I have to tell you that while I was gone with the Dominicans, you were a great chief steward of the argument. And so I really appreciate <laughs> everything that you've done. And I can't stress enough how like the research you did on finding like the church fathers who noted the illusion the even more church fathers that we're finding now still um, right. who have found, you know, made the connection. And so I have to say, Daniel, this argument would not even be, you know, half of what it is today if it weren't for you. And so I appreciate how much you've done. Well, you honor me too much, but uh, I appreciate it. <laughs> Maybe a third. Uh, how about that? <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> uh, I'll take a little, I'll take a piece. I, you know, uh, in, in the sense that I've been really having fun with these deep dives into history. Um, my own background, as you know, is in philosophy, but it's really from the angle of the history of philosophy. So while I call myself a, a, a professor of philosophy, it's really my area is in, in history in the sense that I, I approach things from that perspective, trying to understand texts and mm -hmm. trying to um, go back to the original sources. So that that was fun uh, in the previous video because we went from everywhere from First Vatican Council back to Dante, back to Theodore, and uh, so it's really a, kind of an exciting journey. And I hope today we can do something uh, similar and kind of mm -hmm. journey through time again. Well, Daniel, I know that you have a presentation that you're going to show, but would you mind if I just started off by maybe giving some context for why you know this is relevant, or will you cover that in your presentation? Well, why don't you give the context and then yeah. I, I might reiterate it in the way I present it, but go ahead. Right. So in the debate on the new Eliakim argument, where I basically argue that there's a typological connection between Peter and Eliakim, one of the common objections is that, oh, well, if Peter is like Eliakim, then we see that in verse 25, that the peg, which is attributed to, you know, describing the person, the office of Eliakim somehow collapses. And if that's the case, that Eliakim's office collapses and presumably that means that he no longer has any successors, then if Peter's like Eliakim, ergo, you know, Peter doesn't have successors based on your typology. And I never accepted that line of reasoning, but I did accept the premise originally, okay? And this is crucial. I originally accepted the premise that Eliakim was the last chief steward in the Israelite monarchy. But as time has passed, from the research of, you know, Dr. Vecchio and others, I changed my opinion, and I realized that actually, one, that's not what the Bible is saying. It's not saying that Eliakim's office didn't have successors. And two, there actually is evidence that Eliakim had successors uh, as chief stewards. And so that's what Daniel will be presenting today, the fact that Eliakim did have successors in the Old Testament. The office of chief steward or prime minister uh, did continue. So, Daniel, I'm ready for your presentation. All right, great. Let me... Uh... Let me share my screen and, and let me know that you see it. Uh, right. There we go. That worked, hopefully. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, so we're talking about a succession of royal stewards. And uh, I think, let me see if I get to the next screen here. For some reason, it's 
there we go. Um, I think to really understand the timeline here, we got to talk a little bit about King Hezekiah and uh, his reign uh, and when it happened and some of the significant events that we could mark out. Now, some of these dates are disputed. As you know, history is never certain with dates. Um, I pulled a lot of these dates from uh, a Wikipedia article and then cross-referencing it as best I can. There's been some recent discoveries too. So I'm not sure, I mean, these are all within like 10 years probably, um, but there is one date that's significant that I think is pretty settled. Mm -hmm. uh, so first of all, uh, uh, King Hezekiah is, is a eighth into the seventh century Davidic monarch of uh, the kingdom of Judah. So this is the southern kingdom as opposed to the northern kingdom. And uh, we learn in 2 Kings that uh, 18, that he was uh, a an upright and righteous king, which is kind of rare in the history mm -hmm. of the Old Testament with the kings. Uh, uh, the Bible says he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. Now, D David wasn't his direct father, but the uh, point is, uh, he is a Davidic monarch. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, born about 741 BC, uh, and then um, moving forward, uh, there's estimates that his monarchy started around 716 or 715. Um, and uh, it's important to note that at this time, uh, Within about four years, give or take in either direction, um, the northern kingdom of Israel had had fallen to the Assyrians. And at this time, Hezekiah has kind of uh, been a successful monarch. He's um, uh, conquered the Philistines and, and, and things like that. And he's uh, challenging Assyrian authority. Uh, he stops giving tribute to uh, to the Assyrians. Uh, but they're taking they're taking land. They're they're uh, they are the conquering empire at the time, uh, and, and that sort of gives you a context of what's also going on in the Isaiah twenty two prophecy. Mm -hmm. It's really it's it's considered by some to be a double prophecy or or, or even a triple prophecy about um, conquerors of Israel. Uh, so the the most direct would be Assyria, then Babylon, and then possibly Rome, some people have suggested, but um, interestingly, in the last few months, they've translated a uh, a script that was in the Siloam Tunnel, uh, which recounts all of the great accomplishments of Hezekiah, and it matches very closely to what uh, Second King says of him, that he was uh, a conqueror of the Philistines and gathered land. He had um, cut down the uh, images and the. Uh... Oh, are you there, Swan? Yeah, sorry, I have an alarm on my um, on my phone that I need to deal with. Okay, get it done. Sure. Yeah, that, I'm still here. So he was an uh, uh, opposed to uh, the the uh, the idols of uh, of the Canaanite the Canaanites that was kind of creeping in. He also destroyed Moses's. Uh, bronze serpent because they were starting to worship it mm. um, and th these are all recorded on this new find and they date it to uh, uh, significantly uh, the completion of a water project uh, to 709 BC which um, the significance of that water project is that he was basically trying to create um, a, a system a water system to protect Jerusalem because he knew that the Assyrians were coming for him. He knew that this was a problem. And so we can have a pretty certain confidence that in around 701 BC, which is the right end of the eighth century, we have the invasion of Sennacherib, uh, sorry mm -hmm. if I mispronounce it, uh, who was the Assyrian king at the time. Um, Second Kings 18 mentions that he sends this envoy to, uh, uh, Judah, the kingdom of Judah, and uh, to El uh, Eliakim and Shebna and Joah, uh, and basically this very boastful, mocking uh, in encounter in which uh, God is mocked and, and Hezekiah is mocked, and uh, they basically said, 
God, God's going to allow us to destroy Jerusalem. And uh, um, at, so we know uh, Eliakim is royal steward at that time. So we can have kind of a firm idea that uh, Shebna was royal steward uh, sometime before Eliakim, and then in, at the very end into the, the 7th century, at the end of the 8th century into the 7th century, Eliakim would be uh, royal steward. Uh, so that kind of gives us a, an idea. Mm. And by the way, it's sort of an interesting event. I, I, I don't want to blather on too much about it, but what's really interesting is, uh, especially some of, of the people that have objected to your argument have said, well, we don't know how significant this role of royal steward is, but um, Eliakim is there as in this uh, diplomatic role on behalf of King Hezekiah. Uh, Sennacher uh, Sennacherib has destroyed, according to his own account, 46 cities along the borders of Judah, right? And he's basically saying, I'm coming for Jerusalem. And um, Eliakim basically is acting as the diplomat to negotiate. And uh, he takes the message, brings it to uh, uh, to Hezekiah, uh, and he, he, you know, he's torn, his, rend his garments, and so does King Hezekiah. And Hezekiah sends him to Isaiah. Uh, so uh, Eliakim, uh, Eliakim, however you pronounce it, he, he's mm -hmm. sent off to uh, the prophet. And the prophet Isaiah basically tells them to calm down. Don't worry about it. God's got our back and God's going to take care of it. Um, and when, when he comes back, he basically tells the king what Isaiah has said. And, um, and at that time, I guess the kingdom of Cush comes and, and tries to support uh, Israel uh, or Judah. And, um, and at the end of the day, uh, Sennacherib sends his army back to take Jerusalem, and there's this miracle that is reported where uh, the angel of the Lord comes and destroys a hundred thousands of people. You know, it's just sort of this like uh, complete destruction of the Assyrian army, and they turn and leave. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what, what's interesting is that that account occurs in three places in the Bible, so it's quite a significant event in. Uh, the history of the Jewish people, and it is um, it really is the centerpiece event of Hezekiah's kingship, right? So he, what we could say is that Eliakim is at that center point, communicating between the enemy, Hez King Hezekiah, and the prophet Isaiah, and bringing them all together, communicating this this most center moment, uh, keeping in mind that his water project, the building of fortifications, all the things that Hezekiah is so proud of doing, it's all about facing Assyri uh, the Assyrian army. Mm -hmm. So we can say that this is really the center point of his entire kingship. And at that center, we find um, Eliakim. Mm -hmm. It's kind of an interesting thing. Right. Um, and uh, so then we can say they, Hezekiah's death to around 687, so into the 7th century. Just gives us a context of the time period uh, we're looking at. But, you know, keep keep in mind that uh, Eliakim will be end of the 8th century, likely into the 7th century, uh, early 7th century as uh, royal steward, or Asher al-Habayit, which is, mm -hmm. I'm probably mispronouncing the, the Hebrew term for over the house, uh, which uh, here... On this slide, I just wanted to give us a sense that it's not just a few people mentioned sporadically in the Bible. Uh, the Bible mentions seven people as holding the title specifically, although scholars expand that list um, to those who seem to hold something like that office. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I generated this list here. This is by no means chronological. Uh, as it's really hard to do that, but it's just a list of names, and uh, roughly, I kind of tried my best to guess where they might fall one before the other. But we know um, that um, going back to Solomon and even back to David, there were some um, people who were referred to as stewards, though they were very much 
domestic servants and not full-blown diplomats, as we see it with El Eliakim and Shebna. Uh, but we can see um, that uh, going back to the United Kingdom, uh, we have Ahishar, Idrum, and, uh, and then in the Northern Kingdom of Israel, we still have this role uh, with uh, Azra, Abadiah, and then an unknown, uh, unnamed uh, royal steward in 2 Kings 10.5. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, there's a bulla, which is a, a clay imprint of a seal, of a uh, Mibta Yahu, and I'm not sure which kingdom he was under. I can't get a lot of data from on him, but I, I can show you the bull, the bulla. Uh, I'll show you that on a slide. But he's an eighth century um, royal steward, so I'm, I can't be be sure to say which which kingdom he fell under. Um, and then you've talked about Jotham. Um, mm -hmm. and, now the interesting thing about Jotham, of course, is that he was co regent. And so some dispute that he was a royal steward because of that. But the Bible does say he was over the royal house. So um, so it does seem to suggest that he held that title, uh, which isn't crazy. I mean, we see, I don't know if this is a fair analogy, but we see today that uh, royals can hold several titles uh, depending on different contexts. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wouldn't be shocked that he could have been a co-regent and a, a steward at one point while his king, uh, while the king was sick, and um, functioning the functional king, right? Right. I mean, I think if I recall, the king was his father. Um, yes. And so, in the case of Jotham, what I basically argued in my four-hour-long lecture, um, at a certain portion, I said, you know, either, you know, because he was the king's son he was given the authority of the royal steward because he was trusted over the king's possessions as son. That's one possibility that he held the office of chief steward or the authority that he had was spoken of in chief steward terms. So that would still either way show you something about the importance of the office of chief steward. Um, it would be the equivalent of, for example, how in the New Testament you have uh, the office of bishop or being described as overseer, right? And then let's say you saw somewhere else in the New Testament he oversees the community, right? So mm -hmm. kind of the verb form of overseer. Um, right. Regardless, that would still show you a connection to something about the office of overseer. And so I'd say the same here at Chief Steward, the one who is over the house. Right. Yeah, I, I think, you know, whether whether we want to include him in the list or not, uh, it isn't really the point that I'm trying to make here. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's a good case that he is one. Um, but an interesting inclusion uh, comes here with Hilkiah, which is something that uh, Katzenstein argues in uh, the 1958 article, where it is argued that uh, there's an entire lineage of um, royal stewards that are connected to uh, Eliakim. And so Hilkiah is his father, and the argument is that Hilkiah would have been a royal steward hmm. uh, so sometime prior to Shebna, and that this would have given reason to have uh, Eli can step into that role as someone who might have been familiar with the office at the time. Right. And, so and somebody's going to say, well, oh, if you have Hilkiah, right, who's, let's say, the father of Eliakim, and then you have Eliakim getting the office, it shows you it's hereditary. And you're obviously going to address that later, but that's just something worth noting. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. But of course, Shepna is right. never given a patronym. So uh, we, we don't have good reason to think he's connected mm -hmm. to and it's suspected that Shebna was a foreigner. Right. So, right. Mm -hmm. uh, so this list is antecedent, obviously, to Eliakim. So you might say, well, it's successional at least prior to Eliakim, but was he the final one, right? Um, and, and another thing I want to note is uh, we grant that this role changed and evolved over time from a domestic uh, duties of a, a palace steward who would have been very close to the king and that trusted role just naturally evolved into uh, a much more official position um, over time. And we'll talk about where that role comes from a little bit here in this presentation too. So um, I wanted to spend a moment to talk about uh, this Mibtao Yahu Bula, which I, I recently stumbled upon um, 
in making this presentation. Um, this is an eighth century uh, royal steward, Asher al-Habayit. So this would be probably, I'm guessing, prior to Shebna because of the timeline mm -hmm. uh, and chronology. Um, and so uh, it's really interesting to see this seal because one of the things or objections that we've heard is, well, maybe um, Eliakim is a, a, a unique character in history that he and maybe Shebna held this very lofty position. Mm -hmm. um, but the seal really speaks otherwise to that. Um, how so? Well, the clay bula is actually inscribed belonging to Mibtayahu, who is over the house. So this is his seal when functioning as the royal steward. Um, this isn't something he would just use in personal correspondence, in other words. This is a very specific seal for an uh, official use. So we know that prior to Shebna, this was an official position. Um, so the existence of such a bulla is suggestive of the prominence of Mitabyahu even in the eighth century. And then I, I argue that based on this quote, which is based on a later bulla, which is found, uh, which is connected to Adoniyahu, which shows that the individuals holding this title were sufficiently socioeconomically privileged to own and use seals and were indeed sometimes responsible for written communication. So th this was a sign or evidence of their prominence and importance. Um, and then I have this other quote from Hebrew epigraphy. We learned that the royal steward was a seal bearing official who attached his seal impressions to string wrapped tightly around papyri. These clay boule may be understood as implying that the royal steward functioned in the sphere of diplomacy. Uh, so again, just as Eliakim functioned, we know from the Bible as a diplomat. So other seals signify to us that this role had that consistent theme by the eighth century. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, in the book of Isaiah, it talks about how whatever Eliakim's open, whatever Eliakim opens, none shall shut, whatever he shuts, none shall open. And somebody might say, oh, well, that means he was just or only a palace administrator. But I guess the, the dominant image, if you will, the defining image of his office was obviously opening and shutting the, you know, the, the kingdoms and the real estate of the king. But at the same time, though, contained within that kind of metaphorical description or that description is other functions and powers that he had that were accrued to the office, that were attached to it as time passed on. And so we have to be careful about just because we see in, I don't know, Isaiah um, opening and shutting, we think, oh, okay, it was just being a porter and that was it. And it's like, wait, no, there's a lot more going on there. You know, you can't just kind of have a very rigid, tight reading of just the text. Yeah, that's right. And uh, Fox, who you cite in your own yes. research, um, she's very tentative to make any strong claims, but one claim that she does float is that Eliakim was functioning as a military commander and um, was heading up that diplomatic mission uh, mm -hmm. against the Assyrians. And uh, Fox speculates that perhaps the military commander had already been captured. And so uh, in that case, the royal steward just steps into that role naturally, which mm -hmm. just shows you this ability to cross over into different functions as needed, um, whether it be to serve as acting king or acting military commander or chief negotiator, ambassador, whatever is needed. Um, so this is, and as I said, this this story crops up in Isaiah, in in Second Kings, and uh, in uh, Second Chronicles. Um, so it's a very important event. And we, although he's not mentioned in Second Chronicles, he is mentioned in the other two texts. It shows that uh, Eliakim is central in the center point of a very significant event in the life of Israel uh, or, or of Judah, the kingdom mm -hmm. of Judah. Um, so it's a very central event, very important, um, which I think uh, is a way we might respond to Gavin Ortland's claim that it's a minor 
office in the sense that it really isn't significant in that role. Well, uh, he is, as I said, uh, Eliakim, communicating between prophets, kings, and uh, and the Assyrian king. So, um, in this very miraculous situation. All right. <laughs> I, I wanted to mention also that, and we're going to get to people after Eliakim, but we don't really know too much of who this was, although this is a very interesting inscription from uh, the village of Silwan, uh, which was a lentil piece over the door of a tomb that was carved, uh, which uh, basically we don't know who the royal steward is. You can see it's damaged in the corner, but it, it reports that it, is a royal steward who is buried there with his slave wife is what I think it says. And that uh, anyone who opens it will be cursed. Anyone who opens the tomb will have a curse upon them, which would spook me, I wouldn't open it. But <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, the significance, of course, many see that and they go back to Isaiah 22 in the passage that Shebna was uh, condemned and they believe that this was actually his tomb, and uh, it was obviously uh, uh, what got him in hot water with God. Mm. Um, now, the interesting thing is um, how th that's not a definitive uh, conclusion. Um, the uh, the the lettering is suggestive of the time period of Hezekiah. Uh, since they were able to com compare it to the the writing of that um, uh, that that appeared in the water tunnel uh, mm -hmm. uh, inscription, and so they do place it around the eighth century, I believe. Um, but it could be uh, any real uh, royal steward that whose name ends in that Yao uh, sounding. So uh, I, I quote Katzenstein. Katzenstein has a theory about this, um, and, and uh, this is what is said. In this connection, it is of interest to recall the inscription over the tomb of a man holding the title Asher al-Habayit. If the tomb is that of Hilkayahu, Hilkayah, Asher al this would fit with the choice of his son Eliakim for the post of Asher al -Habayit. It would also explain why Shebna copied the example of Hilkiah by hewing out a rock cut sepulcher hmm. and um, gives the reference to Isaiah 22, 16. Um, I'm not sure. Um, and then in a more recent, that's from the 1960 article, um, but Vanderhoof, Ricci, and uh, Shukran say this in a recent article that just came out that it remains entirely possible, even likely, that the inscription refers to somebody other than Isaiah Shebna, uh, possibly even uh, Adonayahu, who we'll talk about in a moment. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not sure. Um, it's just another significant piece to show, one, these royal stewards would have had the financial ability to, do, to construct a tomb like this. Um, probably not something you want to do if God's condemning it, but mm -hmm. it was done. And it, this also establishes that the role is recognized. It's recognized enough to put it on an inscription and people would know, oh, this is this official. So we can ask the question, was Eliakim the last royal steward? And here I wanted to, um, and this goes back to what you said earlier, where this kind of controversy may have cropped up you had a debate, I believe it was on cap capturing Christianity with uh, Dr. Gavin Ortland. And during that debate, just I think in the intro to the question period, he says, I actually don't know that this is a continually successive office. I don't think we have any way of knowing that it is continually successive rather than sporadic. And he also said, I don't think there are any successors to Eliakim that I'm aware of. And it was at that point you kind of said, well, I can grant all that and still argue my point. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think that led people to kind of this conclusion that there just isn't any one after uh, Eliakim. So that's what we really want to speak to today. Mm -hmm. uh, and one quote that I wanted to start off uh, focused on to kind of directly respond to this question of whether the successors were continual or not. We have this quote from uh, Leighton, Scott Leighton, who 
is often quoted in connection to recent articles around the Royal Stewards uh, in a, a very positive manner. So I, I take Leighton to be somewhat authoritative. And he writes in his article that the title is first attested as early as the time of Solomon and continued in use in Judea and Israel until the destruction of the first temple. Um, so that suggests this wasn't a sporadic one-off or a, a few people. And as we saw in the previous list, there's a lot of people that we could name who may have held that role or possibly held that role. Yeah. Uh, he also says every royal had need of certain officials to perform various administrative functions. That these administrative functions and officials are similar as one moves culture to culture is to be expected. Leighton argues that the office is modeled after the administrative traditions of the Canaanite city uh, states. So one thing we might say is if this office just crops up every now and then, that wouldn't fit very well with the idea that they're, they're trying to model themselves after other city states. It would be almost laughable if they did so only occasionally when they could get around to it. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think that it's like, imagine if uh, every now and then we had a vice president or speaker of the house, maybe right. <laughs> right? Well, as we well, recently you know, experienced. Well, the yeah. interesting thing about that is just, I mean, the reason, one of the reasons why it, it would be ridiculous is because the reason why the office existed, at least in the first place, was to manage the royal estates. And so long as the king has his royal estate, he's going to presumably assign a chief steward to watch over that royal estate. And so that's why it would seem kind of strange and I think very unlikely that it would just be a sporadic office because it served a continual function, which I think is relevant for, you know, the New Testament. But um, Right. And, and, and these kings were not exactly so humble that they didn't want to present themselves as if they had nothing to manage. Right. I mean, right. <laughs> the other thing, too, is that, uh, you know, as noted by Leighton, right, I mean, this goes up all the way to the destruction of the first temple, which is typically dated to 586 B.C., Right. And so that means that, okay, there were people after Eliakim then, if he was in the 7th to 8th century. And, and that's that's consistent with what Leighton will say. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we're going to get there. <laughs> uh, we'll have some names to consider. Mm -hmm. uh, I also want to mention John uh, Cranon, who made a, a lengthy response video to you uh, that, that is worthy of review. Uh, and he repeats this line that uh, he says, quote, Swan claims that Eliakim's office was successional and part of the Davidic kingdom. And then I think this is paraphrastic. I don't think he was quoting you. He says, even though his office did not exist during the reign of David, and it also ends with Eliakim himself. I think that was a paraphrase. I don't think he was quoting you. I don't think you ever said that. But Yeah, I um, never said that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but in response to the David point, there are, I, I think, 12 people that are identified as stewards over his uh, palace and estates uh, in the, the um, and I, I included at one point on a list their names, but I didn't want to confuse people because it's not clear that they were holding that title, really. Um, the title uh, but, of chief steward? Asher, yeah, of yeah. chief. Mm -hmm. They were stewards, he had stewards. Yeah, it wouldn't mm -hmm. be necessarily one singular. Um, but yeah, uh, royals have stewards would be the point. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Daniel, there's something I want to say here, too. Um, actually, maybe two things. So the first is just with the recent comment you made, it would be good to maybe find the names again of the stewards under David's kingdom. But from what I can tell, you know, the office did start off as uh, it originally started off under, I think we see the name of a chief steward or one over the house first appear in the royal administration of King Solomon, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So if yeah. you go back, um, I think, uh, Katzenstein identifies, uh, uh, I might mispronounce it, uh, Hishar, uh, Hishar right. as a, uh, and Idram, I believe as well, as two that would be, uh, that would have held that position. Um, maybe not so, uh, simultaneously, but within Solomon's reign. Right. And then, I mean, you see over time that even though the king had other stewards, this particular steward was the one who began to stand out and receive, you know, the great responsibilities of the kingdom. And so, uh, you know, that's just something interesting to point out that it was 
by having access to the royal estates and managing it that eventually he received greater responsibilities. And I think there's something very kind of reflective of the New Testament about that. You know, the servant who's trusted with just a little will receive greatness in the end. Um, right, that's a, other, an excellent point. <laughs> the other thing I want to say about John's comment here is the my use of the phrase Davidic kingdom, right? Because um, John thinks that when I say Davidic kingdom, I don't know if he's saying that I'm saying this or I should be saying this, but he thinks that Davidic kingdom should refer to just the reign of David himself, right? But I mean, when you look well, at... that David is the prime the archetypal one right so so he's the perfect davidic mm. king because he is david right but yeah go on sorry <laughs> well i was just going to say like you know because he says even though his office did not exist during the reign of david he's bringing that up to say that i shouldn't say it was part of the davidic kingdom and my response to that is simply i mean in isaiah twenty two twenty two, it's the key of what house the house of hezekiah no it's the key of the house of david it's the key of the house of David. So it's still the Davidic kingdom. It's still the Davidic house. It's still the Davidic dynasty. So this is something that I just want to put on the table. Right. And as we said, Hezekiah is identified in scripture as the son of David. Right. So, uh, and we find other sons of David that will hold that key as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and so my comment there is meant to be more of a clarification on why I call the Davidic kingdom in case anyone should feel like they're being misled into thinking um, that it was part of David's monarchy in particular. Right. And, and, and keep in mind, you know, during David's time, there isn't even a temple. So uh, there are a lot of features of the Davidic monarchy that really become normalized after him. So. Mm -hmm. So are there others? And I have a few quotes here that are worth looking at uh, um, to start off. The first is from Katzenstein, 1960, again. Uh, Katzenstein says, after Eliakim's time, the title Asher al habayi is not mentioned in the Bible anymore. Mm -hmm. And so that, oh, well, case closed, right? But the whole point of that article is Katzenstein goes on to argue for others right. and eventually that there is a, a dynasty. Um, and then Leighton says, the final occurrence of the title Asher Habayi comes from a Hebrew bulle, which uh, began to surface on the antiquities market in Jerusalem in October, 1975. The entire assemblage numbered 255 items pressed with at least 211 different seals. Avigad has dated the entire assemblage to the end of the seventh century and beginning of the sixth of the oh I think I cut it off sixth century it should say BC. Mm -hmm. um, so again, um, this goes to the question of timing. If you remember, Eliakim is at the end of the eighth, beginning of the seventh. This these bule would be dated a century later. Okay, and uh, the assemblage bears witness to two officials who bore the title. And there's a typo there. Asher al Habayi. The first official uh, possessed two seals, which three boule have found. Each boule reads belong to Adoniyahu, who is over the house. The second official, known from one boule, which reads belonging to Nathan, who is over the house. Right. So those mm -hmm. are not named by the Bible, but we have reason to believe that they're authentic. Mm -hmm. And indeed, I'm going to go on to show you that in, uh, I think, 2013, they they found more uh, boule uh, belonging or a, a bula belonging to Adonayahu. And it's interesting because they can prove it's from the same seal as the, the one found in 1975. Wow. Isn't that, isn't that neat? Right. And this is after this yeah. is after Eliakim. Yeah, about okay. 100 years. Uh, well, wow. in the seventh century uh, as mm -hmm. uh, Adonayahu. We don't know. I, I can't give you like mm -hmm. an exact time frame, but it looks like more uh, seventh or early sixth as opposed to eighth. Right. Um, with regard to the title royal steward, uh, the net yield from Hebrew epi epigraphy is five boule, one seal, the tomb inscription. These names of officials who bore the title of steward are Adonayahu, uh, Gedal Yahu, Yido, Nathan, and something Yahu, mm -hmm. which may have been Shebna Yahu or Adonayahu or 
<laughs> any of the other yahoos out there right yeah right. it's a common <laughs> ending it's a common it basically means uh, you know uh you know yahweh's uh, servant and something, mm-hmm. something like that so it's sort of like a um, common ending to name uh, connecting mm. to, to to god like l um of officials only uh Gidel yahoo can be identified with an in- individual known uh from the bible and we'll talk about that um it might be one or two individuals that could be uh, Gidel Yahu, and either way, uh, this would be likely the last royal steward of okay. mm-hmm. First Temple period. So here's uh, a, an actual seal, um, and it's a common feature. You'll see the double line that kind of separates the name from the office, mm. and um, uh, so um, this is the one that was uh, ex- uh, found in an excavation in 2013. Uh, so this isn't the one from 1975, but it, it's similar. It says, an earth excavated from the foundations of the Western Wall under Robinson's Arch in, in 2013, a National Service volunteer some three weeks ago unearthed the one centimeter inscribed letter sealer bearing the ancient Hebrew name of a character found several times in the Hebrew Bible, Adonayahu, literally, the Lord is my master. In English translation of the Bible, the name is written Adonijah. Uh, now, when they say character named in the Bible, this person was not those people because the dates don't work. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. But they're saying that that name is a common biblical name. Mm-hmm. According to archaeologist Eli Shukran, this inscription is unique and, quote, of utmost importance. The, royal, uh, the role of the royal steward... Asher al Habayi, he said, appears several times in the Bible and is used for the highest level minister in the royal court. For example, the title of royal steward was used in the book of Genesis for Joseph's high powered position in Egypt. So that's Shukran's take. In other words, he's not disputing this idea, well, maybe it was Shebna and Eliakim who had this high powered office. It's just mm-hmm. taken for granted that. This is a title for an office of a the highest minister. Right. So it's not a, just a minor office, given what the scholar is saying. And the second thing is the allusion back to Joseph is not dubious either. It's something right. that some scholars are willing to accept. Right. And this is 2019. Yeah. Right. So this is very recent research. Right. And again, uh, the significance of the seal um, showing prominence, wealth, um, that they could employ someone to make it and use mm-hmm. it for f- official documents. Um, I got to move some things around so I can read all this. I don't know if it's, um, I apologize. Just give me a moment. Mm-hmm. I just want to add too that, um, you know, I think one thing I really enjoyed about Nilly Sasher Fox's book, um, it was like in service of the King or something like that. Her descriptions of the Israelite offices was that, you know, she's very cautious about making any positive assertions. So somebody might say, oh, well, Swan, you said that was like the most recent work that you had read, right? But then you cited someone from 2013 who was saying, no, I think there's a connection between Joseph here. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, uh, Sasha Fox does conclude that the office of chief steward is the highest office, though, despite all her skepticism on, you know, the historicity of even the Joseph narrative. But the point right. I want to make is... Are... Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. No, you're good. Yeah. I mean, her book came out in like the early 2000s. And so it's interesting just to see that we had someone from 2019, you know, still saying, no, actually, there might be a connection here with Joseph, even though she kind of rejected it. So it shows you at least that um, her argument might not have made as big of a wave, right, as one might think. But it's still like not to dismiss her. Mm hmm. Right. And, and I think you can trace back her argument to Leighton because Leighton also is skeptical of what he he's not skeptical that there is any connection whatsoever because it's worth talking about. And I think it's worth talking about for her as well. Um, but they're just skeptical in the sense that they don't think it can be proved I in see. A, a definitive way. Uh, but what Leighton seems to suggest is, well, the position itself the way it functioned was probably not based on Egyptian um, viziers, but more based on Canaanite. Right. Stewards. City States. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean Joseph had no impact or, or, or on, on some of the 
ideas. I, I mean, I, this is maybe my Catholic both end coming through, right? right? But I don't see it as a di dichotomy. Why, why does it have to be one or the other Egypt or Canaanite city-states? Mm -hmm. I think it's probably Egypt influenced Canaanite city-states, which influenced right. this. And also they have a deep Egyptian connection. So it kind of is a regional thing. Um, right. It's all connected. But, mm -hmm. and, and then, of course, uh, looking at the language of Genesis, uh, I, I, I made a, a post on Facebook about connecting that directly to Matthew. Mm -hmm. And uh, the language there is very suggestive, I would say. I, 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 I'm always tentative as well. I mean, if you're, if you're going to stick your neck out as a scholar, you always have to say, well, maybe. But And, right. and that's what how Fox reads is very uh, cautious. And there's wisdom in being cautious because you don't want to say something you can't definitively prove. And that's why all the dates here, I'm not saying anything definitive here, but I do think we can show that some of these figures were after uh, Eliakim. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a lot of text, but I wanted to highlight a few things here. Uh, these data allow us to confirm several facts. This is from the recent article. Um, so the data analysis of the Bula from Adona Yahoo. First, the two Bula published by uh, Avigad in 1986 were impressed by the same steel, the same seal that produced the new Bula, thus confirming the authenticity of all three. And they even talk about this. the larger crack may have worsened during the life of that seal. This could explain the fainter impression, right? And which would have been impressed in an earlier time when the crack was less severe. So really interesting, the level of analysis they can apply to these. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe Adonayahu had a new seal made, they, they suggest, for the other Bula. So there you go. We even think he had multiple seals throughout his life, which... You know, for someone who's not really mentioned in the literature, it's it's neat that archaeology can sort of give you a little bit of a little story there. He he maybe he was pressing the seal too hard, mm -hmm. and eventually had to get a new one. Um, the bula presents no unusual uh, graphemic morphologies. That's a mouthful, and all the all consistent with the date of the seventh or early sixth century. So, and and they go into a deeper analysis. Some some. Aspects, some jots and tittles, they say look a little eighth century, but you know that they they end up settling on seventh to early sixth for Adonai. Mm -hmm. Um the Bula contributes to the overall understanding of the office of the Asher al Habayit, the one over the house, as much discussed problem in scholarship. They cite Katzenstein, Mettinger, uh, a bunch of other people. Yeah, instead, Mettinger. You see mm -hmm. Fox. Um, I'm not even gonna try. Roots, Wharton, I did, there I did it. <laughs> Lots of different <laughs> figures. So there is a little bit of literature out there on this, but I want to highlight this because the Bula is the first providenced artifact attesting to Adonayahu having this title, he may now be confirmed among the individuals who held this office. So they're they're definitively saying Adonayahu, uh, uh, seventh or sixth century was. Right. So there you have an attested figure. Uh, after that, Eliakim. There, after Eliakim. Apart from the unprovidenced Adonayahu material noted above, three other individuals bearing this title of Asher al Bayit appear on one unprovidenced seal and several unprovidenced bule. And they again mentioned Yido, uh, Mibtayahu, who I, I said was eighth century, it looks like, and they mentioned Nathan again. So th there you go. And this is from 2022, just came out. Mm -hmm. Um, here's another Bula. Again, you see the double line. This looks to be from the end of the first temple period. Okay, so this uh, this is uh, uh, Gedalia, um, who we mentioned earlier. And uh, I want to read this quote. After destroying Jerusalem and taking the cap king captive, Nebuchadnezzar appoints Gedalia, a former royal steward, as the governor of Judah. A stamp seal of Gedalia is found in the Lakish in 1935, which reads, belonging to Gedalia, who is over the house, i.e. the royal steward, the highest official in the land, shows mm -hmm. that Gedalia was a very important person during the monarchy. Um, Nebuchadnezzar likely chose Gedalia because he came from an elite family. Gedalia's grandfather was uh, Shap 
Shaphan, uh, Shaphan, uh, the royal scribe mentioned in King's connection with the findings of the Book of Torah in the time of King uh, Josiah. And that's from uh, Daniel Khan in 2022. Um, so this seal would have been from Gedalia, who was over the house around, uh, again, uh, early uh, 6th century. So towards the, the end of the first temple period, as you said. Um, the general opinion, this is Katzenstein, is that the seal belonged to Gedalia, the son of uh, Ahikam, whom Nebuchadnezzar made his ruler in the land of Judah. Now that's in 1960, and Khan still repeats this, but there are some dissenters. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I wanted to mention that. Identification of the seal as the Gedalia, son of Ahikam, begin in the first editions, and they cite who? Uh, Hook. And can be found briefly stated in numerous general studies. Uh, Leighton also says this, and some of them say with caution. Mm -hmm. Prior to New Bula discovery, Van der Veen supports the attribution of all known Gedalia Bule to Gedali Shan of Akim. He, he previously did, and now assigns all of it to Gedalia son of pa, uh, Pahur, Pashur. So, um, who was Gedalia son of Pashur was a contemporary or lived just prior uh, who would have served under the last king, mm. um, Zedekiah. So um, either way, we're talking about one of the last royal stewards. So this is much later um, mm -hmm. than uh, Eliakim. And again, Bula signifying that they're, they're an official. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to include this. I've got a Bula for that. Uh, so I went to Vanderveen to see what he says, and he he notes that uh, Gedalia seems to have um, many different types of bula. I guess they found four different ones, and they have different endings uh, or different uh, different roles. Um, so while the city of David bula, which only gives the personal name and the patronymic of the seal bearer, so his family name, may have been used predominantly for close colleagues and fa family members. The Lakish Bula gives his precise office held at the court in Jerusalem. As minister over the royal house, he surely held one of the most prestigious positions within the Judea bureaucracy. A Bula bearing this title would have been used primarily for sealing documents related directly to the administration of the palace and royal properties both in and outside Jerusalem. The unprovidenced uh, Mosif and Sassun Bula endow him with the honorific epithet servant minister of the king, <clears throat> and these may have been used for a wider spectrum of bureaucratic correspondences, emphasizing his proximity and loyalty to the Judea monarch. So it seems like this particular royal steward had different seals that he would use in different contexts. Again, showing that when you use a seal that has the royal steward over the house, you're acting in an official uh, capacity. That's an official seal. It's not just like if I were to stamp everything with my name, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and professor, you know, I wouldn't do that when I'm writing to my family, right? When I sign my emails or whatever, it's just you know, Daniel or Danny, depending on the context. Mm. But, I, you know, when I'm writing to students, I use my title, right? And the same way they would use their titles, depending on the context. Mm. So this suggests the seal with Asher al Hawaii would have been an official seal. Think back to uh, the mid Yahu seal, who was using that title in a seal. So this, again, I'm, I'm addressing that concern that uh, Eliakim and maybe Shebna were unique figures who happen to be very powerful mm -hmm. um, doesn't look like it it sounds like if you're using the seal you, you're fit into a role and you're doing certain tasks mm -hmm. that would require documents um now this is an interesting uh, article this is an english uh translation of a he uh, an article written in hebrew by katzenstein which argues for uh, an entire house of royal stewards connected to Eliakim. Uh, Katzenstein says, from the time of Hezekiah to the downfall of the Judean monarchy, about 135 years passed. And for this period, we have seven 
generations or eight holders of the title of him who is over the house belonging to this family, namely Eliakim, which uh, Katzenstein gives the number two designation, mm -hmm. and Gedalia number eight, according to sources. Uh, Hilkiah would be number one. That's the father of Eli Eliakim or Eliakim. And ah ah Ahikam number six, according to our findings, Gamaria number seven, half brother of Ahikam, according to his high position and attitude. Uh, Shaphan, Shaphan the scribe is a natural link because of his important role and his ancestry. Meshulam and Azalia numbers three and four respectively. By this view, we have established a direct line of succession from Hilkiah to Gedalia. Two problems remain for uh, Katzenstein, namely whether Shaphan the scribe was also the father of Akam and why this Shaphan um, the scribe lost his son, Ahikam was the royal steward. Yet all these men have common political ideology similar to the great prophets, which unites them closely and makes them one family of royal stewards. Mm. So that's a very interesting claim. Uh, if so, we have very clear successional uh, post-Eliakim names to draw upon. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. But. Well, I just know that at this point, someone's going to say, all right, great job, Daniel, but you just proved that it's hereditary. So right. well, yeah. we'll talk about that. Yeah, right. Mm. Uh, uh, and, and again, we, we have that Adonia who don't know who, who that would be related mm. to. Um, but, right. But uh, also, so I just, just want to point out, too, that. Oh, sorry, Daniel. I just yeah, wanted to ahead. say that. Um, we're going to also talk about the peg because I think the context of maybe a house of Eliakim will help us see what the peg actually might represent. Right. We'll get there. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. So just to kind of um, tie back to our previous list that it contained Hilkiah, Shebna, we go on to list Eliakim, Meshulam, uh, Azalia, Shaphan, uh, Akam, Jamaria, and Gedalia. And then we have Yidu, Adoniyahu, and Nathan that we have to somehow fit into the list somehow. And, and keep in mind, some of these names, uh, they might be referring to the same person. It's hard to say because some of these people have different names in different contexts too, I found. So I, I don't know if Yidu would, would be identifiable with any of these other people. We don't know. But they do. Ha we do have... Arche uh, archaeological evidence of their existence. So what can we infer from the data? There were royal stewards who were not named in the Bible. So the argument, if the argument's going to be they have to be listed in the Bible, even in the Bible we have royal stewards who are unnamed. But we have clear evidence uh, of Mithayahu, Nathan, Yidu, and Adoniyahu, who we can't identify as biblical royal stewards. So we have to go outside of the Bible uh, to, to see that there is a continuous succession, I think. Um, next, we can infer it's historically extremely likely that at least some inherited the role after Eliakim, given the dating of the bulls of the 7th to 6th century, and Gedaliah, son of Ahakam, who may have been the figure who was made governor under Nebuchadnezzar II, or Gedaliah, son of Pashur, either would have been uh, among the last to serve under King uh, Zedekiah, the last Davidic king of the first temple period. And then I note, it is plausible, plausible that some royal stewards came from the Hilkiah Eliakim dynasty. The two pairs of Asher al Habayi, Hilkiah Eliakim or Eliakim and Akam, Gedalia make it probable that in the last period of the Judean monarchy, the office was held mainly by mainly by one family, the House of Hilkiah. That's Katzenstein, 1960. And then, what's interesting is in recent scholarship, uh, Tov Ganzel says Katzenstein's reconstruction of the seven generation uh, dynastic holdings of the office over the house by uh, Eliakim's family, starting with Hilkiah and ending with Gedalia's son of Ahakim, seems likely. That's her estimate of the uh, of the argument that 
cats and steam makes. So this is not like, oh, that was in the 60s, but new scholarships really overturned it. It's more like this is still a plausible uh, theory that contemporary scholars uh, are willing to assert as likely. So this leads to some questions. Um, can we be certain that those after Eliakim held the same level of power? And, and that was something I noticed in some of the response videos uh, that Dr. Ortland made uh, responding to you saying, well, maybe, and, and I've already addressed this to some degree. Scholars commenting on the royal stewards subsequent to Eliakim, like Eli Shikran and Daniel Khan state that those were the held those who held the title of Asher al Habai, likely Adon Yahu and Gedalia, were the highest ranking officials. So I don't think what I would say here is to say that Eliakim was the last very powerful royal steward is just not consistent with the assumptions of those who are doing archaeology and studying uh, the kingdom of Judah at that time. That's not the their operating hypothesis. Um, now, I don't know if there is evidence that they became less powerful after Eliakim, but I'd want to see scholarship that says that. And I, I haven't found anyone. I've seen arguments that it's developed, right, from an earlier form, uh, but I don't see arguments that it declined in prominence in right. the First Temple period. I, I mean, seen any. yeah, I mean, the, the momentum of development is upwards, in the case of the development that we've seen, you know, throughout the history of this office. And so I think the burden of proof actually would be on someone who says contrary to that, that actually, no, actually it started reversing and going downhill after Eliakim or something like that, or Eliakim was just a one-off in a way. Right. I mean, it seems like as the office developed and then we study other societies that had this office, it was the highest ranking office. It could have all kinds of authority and power. Maybe Eliakim was the next evolution, if you will, in the office. But then from there, the, you know, looking back on the history of it, the office just continued to get more and more powerful. And then you have the seals that continued to kind of show, okay, they kept high socioeconomic status. Uh, what was it? Gedalia had multiple seals. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, it just, was it Adana Yahoo was able to fix his seal, get a replacement right. one? So, right. At least if we had to go off of that evidence, there were successors to Eliakim, and they still retained, you know, a great degree of power. Um, and I, I feel I feel like that's enough, perhaps, to get across the idea that this was the highest ranking office under the king. Under the king, right. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, just to, to tack on to that point, um, why why is it that Eliakim might come across as very powerful or very important is because his name mentioned his name is mentioned several times in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I think that is because he's very closely connected to Isaiah mm. and to this miraculous event in which um, the Assyrian army is routed. It, it, it's inexplicable that, it, that they were routed. In fact, uh, I think Herodotus talks about it in his second book uh, where uh, it, when he's recounting uh, this event, he attributes it to Egypt and says that the Egyptians prayed to their God and the, their God sent mice to destroy their army. The suggestion being that mice bring, might be connected to the idea of plague or pestilence. Mm -hmm. And um, and this angel of the Lord that came to, to destroy the Assyrian army might have been something like plague. Mm -hmm. um, right. And so this this event obviously stuck out in the minds of the Jewish people, and it was connected to Eliakim. So when people say, well, Eliakim's not really connected to the story of God's people and God's salvation, uh, I would say, on the contrary, this is a very significant event of one of the more righteous kings of Israel. And mm -hmm. it, it's such a significant event, it finds its way even in Greek histories. So. Hmm. They're trying to understand it. I mean, it. The Egyptians, and it's understandable because, of course, Cush was involved in this conflict, and um, uh, you know they're trying to understand. Uh, but of course, the, the problem with Herodotus is that it's not clear that the Assyrians ever really made it to Egypt. 
but they did make it to the borderland of, of Judah and never took Jerusalem. So there needs to be an explanation for that. And the explanation of the Jewish people is that God said, not an arrow will fall in Jerusalem. And mm -hmm. they were they were destroyed. And uh, so this is sort of one of those events on the level of like a, a Moses event, right? Against Pharaoh. That's mm -hmm. the sort of level that you might put this event for them. And uh, Eliakim's at the center of it. So that's why I think he is a center figure that's named in the Bible because he's so closely tied to that event. But that doesn't mean the other royal stewards were less powerful or less uh, held a, a lower rank in mm -hmm. their the kingdom after him. It's just they weren't connected with a miraculous event, right? right? So the Bible doesn't record it. I mean, all we could conclude maybe is that they were powerful, right? And that's all we can really I, like if you wanted to be really conservative, I feel like the most conservative conclusion you could come to is just the successors of Eliakim were powerful and just kind of leave it open. Right. Right. When you say that they weren't as powerful as Eliakim, that's when the burden of proof increases for me when you start making those very specific claims. So if you just say they continue to be powerful, the highest ranking official likely, I mean, and then here's where I'd go to just something that's more likely than not which is that they kept the momentum of the development of the office going. Right. I mean, certainly, you know, just like our, our, our own history of popes, some popes were more prominent, more powerful, more assertive than others. Uh, just like in our history of presidents, right. some, you know, <laughs> some presidents are, are stand out, you know, Washington, Lincoln. And mm -hmm. then there are, I remember the Simpsons had a very funny, um, musical number about like the unimportant presidents mm -hmm. do you remember that i don't know i don't I, not that one in particular but that okay. sounds like well, a good bit yeah it, it's just like all the like kind of like um you know uh, unimportant presidents mm -hmm. <laughs> um so they're probably less important royal stewards after alike and in what they accomplished and what they did but the office is what we're really talking about here and is right. the office understood to be um you know, under the king, one of the highest ranking officials. And that seems to be the working assumption of most of the scholars familiar with the topic. Mm -hmm. uh, now, was the role of the Asher al-Habayi after Eliakim exclusively from the house of Eliakim? Uh, now, this is where we get into that concern that you raised. Isaiah 22, 24 notes that Eliakim's offspring will hang from the peg. And Katzenstein says that this was, quote, mainly from the house of Eliakim. But there's no historical reason to say that it was exclusively a hereditary role after Eliakim. So I think we could talk about it as a dynasty akin to the way we might talk about the Clintons or the Bushes right. <laughs> or uh, the Kennedys, right? Or or, or even talk about uh, other uh, sort of dynastic rule rules that um, you know may come and go, but aren't exclusive during a period. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then Vanderveen makes an interesting point with the Gedalia Bula may not have been Gedalia ben Ahakam of the house of Eliakim if we follow Katzenstein's reasoning, mm -hmm. but Gedalia ben Pashur. So we can construct the following dilemma. It is likely one or the other, right? One, those are the two Gedalias that are kind of on the table. It could be right. a third unknown, but like those are the two likely ones. But either way, there is a well-attested Asher Halbait after Al uh, Eliakim that may or may not have been related to him. Uh, if right. related to El Eliakim, this fits with the prophecy in Isaiah 22, 25, and the Babylonian exile signaling the end of the house of Eliakim, which is Katzenstein's point. Mm -hmm. uh, if no, So that's the pegs removed at some point. If not, then the royal stewards after Eliakim need not have been hereditary descendants of Eliakim as some have recently suggested. And the fact that this is an open archeological question strongly implies that the experts have not used heredity as the decisive factor in identifying the Bula, mm -hmm. which would mean that there's no reason to think that after like him, heredity was, an innate, was innate to the office or that an explanation is owed for why the Petrine office is not hereditary, right? So in other words, you don't see Vanderveen saying, well, it has to be this guy because we can connect him to like him. No. And this is what he actually says. Indeed, I prefer to think that all four Boulay could have been belonged to 
uh, Gedal Yahu, um, Ben Pashur, simply because the stylistic affinities between all four boule are very striking indeed. The final proof for this, however, will have to await further evidence from archaeology. Mm -hmm. So he's not saying that it's sort of this hereditary thing. It, it's going to take finding more seals. And, and that's what will decide this. Now, he makes this argument for Ben Pashur based on the similarities of the seals, but it's he he does admit that one very plausible explanation for this is that both Gedalias hmm. were operating at the very same time and went to the same seal maker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Since they they were they were basically contemporaries. Now he, he thinks, well, since we know one of them had a seal, the Pasher, that he's the one that had the patronym. Um uh, he, he wants to say, we know he was a prominent person and that he was opposed to the other one. They were actually in rival camps. Um, and and uh, so that that's why he doesn't, he thinks one of them would have had the more prominent role and the other one wouldn't have. Um, but I, I kind of like the theory of Katzenstein and it fits with what Khan has to say, um, that it is um, this Gedalia Ben Akim, so mm -hmm. the son of uh, Khan. Right. So know. it's not it's not, let's say, as you put it, innately or intrinsically hereditary. But what it what, what could happen is, let's say that, I don't know, you well, nepotism. Right. Or you build a dynasty somehow and you have your family has a good reputation and name, as right. is the case with like what Isaiah says in verses 23 to 25 in chapter 22, talking about how Eliakim's offspring and descendants are going to hang on this peg. And, and then eventually the bur the burden of this peg will cause the peg to give way, right? And then th it seems to make more sense with what you're saying here as we look at all the evidence that the Bible's not saying the office ended with Eliakim, right? Because why bring in then the offspring then, you know? Or that he would be an honor to his father's house if he's the one who's going to end the, the office. Right. That makes sense, right? Um, right? But, you know, he marks this, a high point in his, in his father's house and presumably when the whole kingdom goes down with uh, Nebuchadnezzar, that's when also the office of chief steward goes down. The, ch the office right. of chief steward is connected and exists so long as the kingdom exists. And Gedali uh, becomes named governor. And one right. of the arguments for why he would have been the royal steward is that Nebuchadnezzar was simply looking for someone who could do the job. Right. Right. You, you, you've done the job. Just We're just going to call you governor now because... You're not a royal steward of, of the Davidic house anymore. There's no more. That's no more. Uh, but you'll function as governor. Right. And uh, then he was assassinated. So it didn't work out. That's him. sad. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, poor guy. Um, all right. So, and and this this leads to our, our last point. Um, one of the last slides I have. The textual allusion suggests that the peg of Isaiah 22, 23 is replaced um by Christ with the image of the rock in Matthew right. 16, 18. This is something that you developed uh, very well. If the peg represents a semi-fixed firm fixture by which a successional dynasty is established, the offspring of the house of Eliakim will hang from it, as Katzenstein argues, then what might the rock suggest about the successors of the Petrine office? Mm -hmm. In other words, if these objects are functioning as um, Met, uh, what would we say, like a metaphor for succession. Mm -hmm. One's a peg that's going to be removed. The other's a rock that seems to be much more permanent. Um, and I, I would argue that the rock suggests a permanent succession. Mm. That's me going, sticking my neck out. Uh, of course, as a Catholic, I kind of have to say that there's a succession. <laughs> right. Uh, now, Katzenstein notes... Uh, in, in a footnote that Isaiah 22, 25, that's the, the peg being pulled, may be understood as a later interpretation to explain the downfall of the house of Hilkiah, and then uh, cite some, some people on that. Now, this is obviously a naturalistic interpretation of the prophecy, right? Because from, from these scholars, they can't just outright say Isaiah is a prophet who would have been able to foretell the future. Mm -hmm. It has to be that he was saying, oh, this mighty house will rise, and then somebody had to come in later, or, and it fell, you know, and, <laughs> right? Well, I, I, since I, I believe in God and I believe in uh, 
that Isaiah was a prophet of God, I would say that Isaiah 22 is a prophecy, uh, not so much, although it, it, it is talking about um, the Assyrians, uh, I think that the, the real warning for Isaiah is ultimately about Babylonian captivity. Mm -hmm. And so um, the downfall of Hilkiah or Eliak, uh, Eliakim fits perfectly with the fate of Gedaliah, the royal steward, made governor by Nebuchadnezzar II, who was subsequently assassinated. And we see that in Jeremiah uh, 41. So the, the Babylonian captivity ends with, an, uh, and eventually there is a restoration of the monarchy in Judea with the Hasmonean and Herodian dynasties, but these are non-Davidic and not normal. Uh, and, and I think the Hasmonean, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but they're connected with the Levites, which were not supposed to be kings. And, yeah, the priestly uh, class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so this was really, uh, you know, if people want to point to these irregular kingdoms that arose after in the build-up to the Second Temple and say, well, we don't have great evidence for royal stewards, these would not be Davidic kings. So I, I don't know what to make. We, we do know that there probably were some stewards, you, even uh, the Tetrarch uh, Herod Antipas had a, a named steward uh, Chusa in the New Testament. Mm. I don't know how powerful, what role that really was, or what a tetrarch really was considered some sort of king or quasi king, more like a governor, I think. Um, the next and final Davidic king, then, uh, after Zedekiah, is Christ. And he gives the king keys of his kingdom to Peter, the rock upon whom the church is to be built. No oracle of the rock being removed, replaced, or failing. And so no reason, no reason to think that there will be an equivalent Babylonian captivity, which would abrogate the role of the royal stewards in Christ's kingdom. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I put it that way. Uh, some of your listeners might be familiar with uh, some of the set of Acantus literature and videos produced by the Diamond Brothers. And they often try to, to use the Babylonian captivity as a way of speaking about um, the current uh, vacant seat of Peter. Right. They're saying, well, it's a repetition of a Babylonian captivity of the Davidic monarchy. But if this interpretation is right, and I think it is, uh, then they would have to suggest that Christ should have used the image of a peg hmm. instead of a rock. So I guess they should try to correct Jesus on that one. Mic drop. <laughs> oh, and then uh, for anyone who's interested in the sources, you can kind of screen capture that and check it out, or uh, you can contact me. And uh, But that these are the, the, there's obviously a vast literature. One of the fun things about, uh, about doing these deep dives is you find an article and then you go to the citations and you find more stuff and more yeah. stuff and, and, and it just grows. So th this is sort of what I was using for these slides, but there's a lot of stuff out there. And I do want to um, give a shout out to Professor Ricci, who uh, helped me uh, to obtain her art, the article uh, for this research because uh, uh, it, it, so new, it was behind a paywall and uh, I wasn't sure if it was going to be helpful. So I asked her if she would mind sharing with me and she did. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate that. Uh, you know, uh, these academic publishers, they, they want to charge you 50, 60, 70 bucks to, to look at an article. They don't realize <laughs> that researchers are research. They'll scan hundreds of articles before they find one that's relevant to their research. And no one has like 500, 600 bucks. So we have to contact the, the authors to see if they're willing to share uh, sometimes to help with that. And that, that, was, that was greatly appreciated. So that's well, all. Do you have Do you have any last words or comments, questions you wanted to raise? Yeah, I think um, just some comments. I think the uh, you know some people are going to say, well, okay, sure, this is all good. Then fine, Eliakim had successors. Doesn't mean Peter had successors. You still got to work on proving that. And I mean that's a challenge that I'm willing to take up and you know explore more and maybe even develop. I mean, obviously, I'm going to be developing arguments for succession with some of the things that you mentioned with the rock imagery. Um, you know, it's interesting because John Noland or Noland in his commentary on Matthew, who is famous for rejecting the textual illusion between Isaiah and Matthew. He also addresses and argues against succession from the rock imagery. But I wonder if 
we could get the illusion in, like, let's say, hypothetically, we could convince Dr. Noland or Noland to be uh, to accept the illusion. And then you combine that rock imagery. Could it actually, I mean, I think it would increase the probability that there is some notion of succession, if you will. There's the house of Eliakim as expressed with the peg. Then there's the house of Peter, if you will, expressed with the rock. That might be a possibility. Um, although I know New Testament scholars will say that the title of Peter being, or of Simon Peter, of Simon the Rock, essentially, um, is kind of only belonging to him, right? But then the interesting thing is that even with the peg in the Old Testament, it's technically Eliakim's peg, but it's used to describe the future of his dynasty, of his descendants. Right. So it's not incompatible. You know, you can do both. But no, this it, gave me a lot to think about. There is so much going on in Matthew 16 that it alone is an argument for God. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, yeah. there, there, I don't think any human mind could come up with the amount of illusions going on in that, in those verses. It's just the amount, of, and, and this is like an overall argument, is that there's so much layering of the Bible itself, so much cross-referencing so much hyperlinking, if you will, uh, that it, it is, there is no bottom to the depth of meaning. And, you know, we've talked about the, the name, Peter, Rock. Right. Uh, Caiaphas. Caiaphas, Caiaphas. We've talked about, mm -hmm. you know, th this connection to Isaiah. And it just get, goes on and on and on. That, that Christ using just a few words right, could <laughs> communicate so much meaning to the church it's really extraordinary it's divine um mm -hmm. and and the other thing i, I wanted to say one other point uh, but um uh, but now it's escaping my mind I, oh apologize. that's okay mm -hmm. but uh yeah I, I think that ultimately uh with respect to the question of succession uh i'm always drawn back to to the selection of a successor to judas um, it says our ministry, we need a successor for this ministry. What ministry? Well, it's the apostolic ministry. That's a ministry Peter has. So he's thinking it's a successional office. Then we go to Clement of Rome. We see that it was communicated by Christ to the apostles that there would be a need for succession. So to me, you look at the, the history, uh, even the New Testament, and then going forward, uh, the history of the church, to, again, it's a burden to me uh, on the other side to give us really strong arguments that uh, there shouldn't be Petrine succession mm -hmm. um, because there does seem to be good reason and historical arguments that that is what the apostolic churches understood going mm -hmm. into it. That, okay, the, these sees that were being founded by apostles were being, were somehow connected in a successional way. Um, so uh, yeah, the, that to me, and, and we we talk again um, uh, about Joshua Sijuati's a priori argument. That part of that would be that it makes sense. Once you have an office like this, there's a need for it. Why would it suddenly right. go away? Why would it again? What what is the argument that it would be abrogated as uh, as um, Father Andrew Dalton? Mm -hmm. Father Andrew Dalton has said mm -hmm. it just doesn't it, it doesn't stack up to me that. Uh, just because you don't have a list at the back of the Bible that gives you the, the succession of the first century. Um, but again, we're not solo scriptura. We have to look at the evidence of history and we have to think about what makes sense um, a priori when, when we're considering offices and ministries. Yeah. I and mean, that's, that's what I was saying. And even as we were talking about before with the, you know, how powerful were the successors of Eliakim? Someone could say, oh, no, I need positive, explicit verification, not just a bunch of seals on the power of this office or what have you. Right. And it's like, well, in any other circumstance where maybe we weren't doing an apologetic debate or apologetics debate, um, would you have asked that question or demanded that kind of evidence? Well, no. Right. And so it seems like sometimes I call this like the fallacy of great expectations or the fallacy of the ideal where you know, when, when the debate really matters to you, right, you want the, the, the 100%, uh, un, uh, you know, well, let's say perfect piece of evidence, and you want it to all be kind of put out clearly and nicely, because it means a lot to you. 
And it's like, well, that's not the best way to approach the evidence, right? And so if someone, uh, let's say, is a skeptic um, or exercising skepticism, because I don't want to use that as a totalizing word, like, oh, you're a skeptic, right? But, uh, but if someone's exercising skepticism, one thing you have to ask yourself is, is your skepticism reasonable? Is it consistent? Is it, you know, something that one would ordinarily have? Or do you have a good reason to want to be skeptical? Or are you kind of begging the question by saying, well, I, you know, I don't believe the papacy. So I'm going to say you need to meet this bar for me to believe. Well, you're bringing baggage into the debate then. Right. Yeah, I, I often think of this as the sort of fallacy I see, no offense to Matt Dillahunty, where he'll often, in response to a very well-constructed argument, just say, well, I'm not convinced. And, right. and that's not really an argument, you know, uh, it's it just an expression of your psychological state. Right. Uh, and so that might be for many reasons. It might mm. be for many reasons that you're not convinced. Uh, I always go back to the uh, brilliant William James, uh, the pragmatist philosopher, who says that we have two epistemic duties. One is to believe truth and the other is to avoid error. And they're not the same duty. So if you're sort of stuck at the mindset of, I want to avoid error, uh, a very easy way to do that is to be a, a skeptic. Mm. And uh, if that was our only epistemic duty, it'd be very easy to fulfill that duty because all we'd have to do is just not believe anything. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. it's much harder to believe truth and to build cases and to find evidence. It's much easier to say, I don't know, and shrug. Um, and so that's where you have to roll up your sleeves and assess the evidence and come to uh, the best conclusions you can given the evidence you have. And as I say, even in presenting this, I'm sure there's someone in the comments who's going to say, oh, you know, I, I, I've read this article or, oh, I think you're misrepresenting Leighton on this point. And that's fine. I'm willing to to adjust and, and correct my errors. Um, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what's at stake is so important because truth is important. Right. And, you know, the what you said so far, I think, is just basically what they're saying. You weren't doing that much of your own interpretation. You were just yeah, saying I, what they're saying. So I, I mean, tried to highlight where I, I you know, my sure. opinion is that, you know, that Peter had successors and my opinion, I think that there was a, a house of like, and I think there's good reason to uh, now, would I say it with 100% certitude? I, no, mm -hmm. I wouldn't bet my life on it. But, you know, I, I think that that Katzenstein makes a good case. I think it's interesting that um, that Gansel continues in that tradition of saying that the evidence really speaks strongly for Katzenstein's mm -hmm. interpretation. Uh, could could mm -hmm. Katzenstein be wrong? Sure. Uh, but even if Katzenstein's wrong, we still have Bula from the 7th to 6th century uh, right. that confirmed that there are people after uh, Eliakim. And we have Leighton saying this would have been a continuous role. Mm -hmm. So I think there's just good reason to say it's not a sporadic, one-off, mm -hmm. unique sort of thing. Um, and that's with all due respect to Dr. Ortland, who I, I you know, I really appreciate him. Uh, I, you know, we need someone uh, to to give us uh, some traction in this debate, and he's done a great job doing that. Um, it, it can be frustrating at times, uh, of course, whenever you get pushback. But um, but overall, I, I I really appreciate what he's done and uh, what John Cranman has done. I think we couldn't be where we are without mm -hmm. them. Um, that said, you know, would I like them to be convinced? Sure. Um, and uh, maybe they will. Maybe right. not. <laughs> yeah. That's and this, <laughs> I, I have literally three last comments and then I'll try to close it out. Okay. So the first is this. I, I have read commentaries. I was able to find the source or one of the sources. It was something like the Dictionary of Old Testament Theology and Exegesis, where it claimed uh, the peg coming down means Eliakim's office is coming to an end. There's no more chief stewards or what something like that. So it was in there. Um, so when you read a commentary uh, on Isaiah and the question of, let's say, Eliakim's successors come up or something relevant to that, always look and see, does that commentary mention the archaeological finds that Daniel has brought up? Because I actually look back and I think there were um, some commentaries from the 70s that were mentioning, you know, Katzenstein's and others' research and avoiding 
making the statement that the office came to an end. So that's something to put a check on for commentaries, right? Because someone might say, oh, well, it's not in my commentary, so therefore, or it's not in my volumes that I have. So, you know, it's like, well, no, okay, look at the quality, right? If they mention this specific piece of evidence or allude to it, right? Um, the second, and I should also say that, yeah, it, even back in the 70s, I've seen scholars who were saying, oh, yeah, the peg refers to the house or dynasty of Eliakim. So this isn't also just a recent thing. This is this position has been around. Um, the second thing was when I mentioned the fallacy of great expectations, I realized that it's Sagan saw, right? Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And what counts as extraordinary is, I guess, in, in a lot of cases, really subjective, right? But, um, you know, for example, somebody who's experienced miracles, maybe for them to get to God is a lot less than, let's say, someone who is maybe a scientist working in a lab all day. Right. The third thing I want to say, too, is that sometimes when people take Sagan saw, apply it to the Catholicism debate and say, well, if God wanted me to believe the papacy, he'd give me more evidence. Well, then that's just divine hiddenness. But except it's directed now towards Catholicism. So we've talked about before how, you know, there's sometimes Protestants can argue like atheists. So there's your analogy. But Daniel, what you've accomplished today is incredible. It's given me a lot to think about. I found it really helpful and it's going to help me in my presentation at the end of the month. Do you have anything you want to say really quick? Well, just really quickly, I, I know you're working on a presentation that will give some of the uh, exegetical um, methods that we've been talking about uh, with your team. Yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, to to develop it um and so how does this fit into that just really quickly is that uh i think ultimately we would want to argue that um there's some sense in which um we should think succession is uh, a part of this sort of office uh in its uh fulfillment mm -hmm. um, and that unless there's really strong uh reasons to think otherwise and my point would be it doesn't look like there's really good evidence. Of course, we'd be open to what the evidence would be. And then we'd say, oh, oh, that makes sense. Okay, so Peter getting the keys, it was meant to be abrogated. Maybe, uh, you know, if we didn't read some part of the Bible that said that. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I just, I think that the principles you're going to develop really will show how this video uh, will help us understand succession as a very important key to establishing uh, the Petrine office. Uh, succession is obviously a very important aspect of that. And then also, we've talked a lot about the prominence of the role in terms of its power and authority. And so we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> yeah. Well, Daniel, I appreciate your, your help. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. God bless you, Daniel. God bless.